Hello, and welcome to Brain Health Matters, a podcast dedicated to helping you connect with the people and resources that will help you improve your memory, boost your brain, and reduce the risk of developing dementia. This week, the Mindfulness Man joins us to share the many ways that meditation can help us concentrate, learn, and deal with stress. Stay tuned. You have 86 billion reasons to go vegan, and they're all resting right between your ears. That's right, 86 billion neurons that make up the master controller we call our brains. And while they're in control, our lifestyle choices determine how well they work, and that means we must nurture and protect them. The best way to do that? With a whole foods vegan diet that nurtures not just the physical, but also the emotional, mental, and spiritual brain. In the vegan brain, you'll learn how whole plant foods can nurture the healthiest version of yourself and, perhaps more importantly, how your choices can reduce suffering for countless animals and help create a more compassionate, sustainable world. The Vegan Brain Second Edition also includes nutritious recipes and meal plans so that your journey towards a kinder, healthier future will be easy and delicious. Available in ebook format on Amazon. Hello and welcome. I'm so happy to have you here. My name is Kate Kunkel. I'm the host of Brain Health Matters. And this week, Christopher Manning is joining us to talk about the power of meditation. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you very much. Christopher Manning started his career as a menswear fashion designer. When he found the spiritual path 20 years ago, he felt he was wasting his life by just feeding his ego. He lost interest in his career as he fell deeper into his meditation practice and almost left his young family to become a Buddhist monk. But Christopher decided he would first try to make both worlds work as one. Now he feels he's discovered that way by teaching what he's learned as well as realizing that he can be a light wherever and whomever he is with. He's still a fashion designer and now sees it his job to be a bringer of light into that industry as well. Thank you so much, Chris, for your work. Thank you. I appreciate that. So <laughs> let's talk about, we, we did just briefly before we got on the air here, about what meditation is. Because a lot of people think it means sitting cross-legged with your fingers just so. People say to me, um, like I run meditation classes, and I ask people to come because I know it will really help them, you know, when they're stressed and filled with worries and the first thing they say is I can't clear my mind and um, you it's not about clearing your mind at all Um, you watch the mind wherever it goes whatever state it is the mind may settle a little and it often does and that can be quite blissful but it might not at all but that's still meditation so it's it's more like almost just being mindful of what's happening in your head. Yes, yes. And we're better to approach it from a physical perspective because the body is always in the present. Whatever you touch or feel, you're feeling it now. Whereas the mind, although the thoughts are in the present, are normally about the future or the past. So we can contact the present much better and hold it much more firm in the present using the body. Oh, that, you know, that's a really good point. I never thought of it that way because your body can't be anywhere else. Exactly. And your breath, for instance, the breath is one of the greatest tools because you don't have a breath that happened yesterday. You're having the one that's happening right here and right now. Perfect. So that's why, I mean, I, I, I do in, encourage my clients and um, people in my groups to use their breath as a way of finding whatever it is, you know, to, to get calm and centered. Is that how you would have people start? Yes, definitely. There's many, many reasons to use the breath. Another one is um, the insights that come into your mental and physical stress state. If you are relaxed, your breathing slows down. So you're seeing the the effects it's having in that moment. And if you start having a nervous thought or 
worry in or whatever, your breathing rate will change and go up. Um, and you were talking about controlling the breath. Do we control the breath? Now we don't control the breath. We allow the breath to be as it is because that's given us extra insights. And it's also a process, a physical process of letting go. So you let go of being the breather because the body, the body can do it all by itself. It doesn't need your interference. And wherever we can, we interfere in absolutely everything. Now, everybody's always saying, let go, let go, let go. It comes to their breathing and they're there meditating, pushing it in, pulling it out, trying to maintain control. And it's the perfect opportunity to fully let go and allow the body to breathe all by itself. I have to say, I never thought of it that way, that we are always trying to control. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of people who teach meditation say, start by controlling the breath, the box breathing or whatever it is. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, that does have its place. Um, <clears throat> what you're talking there, talking about there is something called pranayama. And that is breath, that sort of breath energy control. So that's changing the length of the breath and everything. And that does have lots of great positive effects. It calms the mind, calms the body. But in mindfulness, we train with whatever is here. We don't alter a single thing. So it's more, it's more an accepting of whatever shows up and learning from that. An observation and learning. Wow, that's that's yeah. a, I love that point of view. So what do you think? Now, I want to go back. I should have done this at the beginning. You in your bio, bio, it says you found your spiritual path 20 years ago. What was your trigger? Everybody seems to have a reason for whatever it is, you know, that sends them on this path. What was your trigger? <clears throat> well, I say it happened 20 years ago, but this might sound really strange. Um, but I used to meditate as a very, very young child. Now I found this out. I was on a meditation retreat, a 10 day meditation retreat. And during that, a circle, I saw a circle of light and it reminded me of something I used to do when I was a child, when I was about three, I used to press the balls of my eyes at night and hold them. And if you do that hard enough and long enough, a circle of green light comes. <clears throat> now, what I used to do, I'd get that circle of light and then I'd let go and I'd watch it change and I'd try to hold it still. I then did some research and found out that it's actually an ancient yogic technique called Tratak. And um, I discovered it or did I you know it makes me think this whole thing about past lives and yogis um, basically carrying on um, what they've done so that was at about three years old and I've always been spiritually inclined um, even as a teenager I used to do other things as well but what really set me off um, I think I got very, very serious as soon as I had children. I had children and I went from being lightly interested to pretty obsessed. As well as that, I've, um, <clears throat> I've battled my whole life, unbeknownst to me at the time, with ADHD. <clears throat> I went from suffering a great deal, um, not being able to get my life in order, being an absolute walking calamity. I went from that to people describing me as the most laid back person they've ever met. <clears throat> so I went from one extreme to another. Wow, from meditation, from meditation, yeah, wow. Just with meditation and that happened in a couple of months. Wow, what hope for people because so many people struggle with, with that and other, um, and maybe not diagnosed conditions, you know, anxiety and depression and, and ADHD. And even as, as adults, so many people are um, diagnosed much later and they have struggled their whole lives like you did. 
it's this gives them such hope because many people feel the only answer is in drugs or you know intense therapy that may or may not do anything Mm -hmm. you know radical diet changes those sorts of things while we do have to watch what we put in our bodies it just seems that it takes so long and it must be so frustrating to hear you say that it happened so quickly is so uh, encouraging it did and um i only got diagnosed um this year uh, at 52 at the age of 52 and meditation showed me as well you know where my issues were i was able to observe myself in a much better way and i was able to discover this now i wouldn't actually knock the medicine side of it either um because it's definitely got a place and as well as that my meditation masked my symptoms so well that it was as if I hadn't had it. Um, it kind of made me normal, but you know, I was having to meditate between two to four hours a day to uh. to keep it that strong, and I can't always do that. So understood. You know, that's really interesting because I have a brother-in-law who was. Um who had a lot of issues and the only way he could get through them was by like exercising. And when I say exercising, it was intense exercise for hours and hours a day. And when you just said that, it's sort of like exercising your brain, doing something to produce whatever it is that we need in a, on a hormonal or neurotransmitter basis that helps that. Let's get to that then. So you, you were able to function, maybe not actually deal with the underlying condition, but able to function. Do you think that having a diagnosis then later and also recognizing that could make whatever medical treatments work better? Or did you have- Definitely. Definitely? Definitely. And it's it's as if it's a medicine in itself. Um, When my practice is strong, and by that I'm talking about four hours or so, well, sorry, two to four hours, when I'm very, very deadly serious like that, I don't have a single problem at all. My, my focus is laser sharp. I'm sharper than others. And um, so, so it's not a problem then. It's only a problem when it slips for a few days. And, and then, you know, you know, I might go on a work trip or something. My routine gets thrown out and... Um, then the problem starts again. <laughs> Understood. But I was very interested, actually, um, what you were saying about, was it your brother-in-law um, with the exercise? Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, is released through very intense exercise. And that in itself, intense exercise, is... Um, a new cure for ADHD. They're using that as a cure for ADHD and, and, and depression. And it's showing to be, to prove to be as well, as strong as uh, medication. We know that people who uh, have cognitive decline, that that can be alleviated with exercise. We know that we need to exercise to keep our brains healthy, to prevent cognitive decline. And so it makes perfect sense then. Whatever it's doing in the brain is is amazing. Perhaps production of this BDNF. Yeah, and the same with, um, the same with meditation. Um, they did some scans on this Buddhist monk and they found that his brain, I think it was 20 or 30 years younger than it should be. So he was about 17, had the brain of like a 40 year old. That's amazing, isn't it? That it can actually change the structure. You mentioned in our, in our pre-talk a little bit about gray matter. Tell us about that. So is that what you were referring to with the Buddhist monk? It is, yeah. So um, we lose gray matter um, as we age. And meditation um, not only can keep it stable, it can actually build it back up. So it can actually literally start growing the brain again. You grow new brain cells. 
think of all the people that that suffer they are diagnosed with something and they're just told well you know there's nothing you can do go take this drug but nobody gives them any help like that and it could have been it could be so helpful pretty quickly now we've got the mental health benefits we've got some brain health benefits going on here brain structure benefits but people like you said they have trouble getting started i can't focus or i can't empty my mind so if you were teaching someone new and they came to you with that issue how would you get them to start i would get them to start by listening to guided meditation because one of the one of the problems that we have um, in meditation one of the hindrances is doubt so if you sit there for 10 minutes you are definitely going to be thinking i'm not doing this right i can't possibly I'm not meditating. And you'll throw the towel in before you know it. Whereas a good teacher will recognize that and in the guided meditation will address that several times. So they will say something like, um, you will have the thought, am I doing this right? Everyone else seems to be getting it right, but me, uh, but everyone's having that thought and yes, you are. And if you're having that thought and you're seeing it, you are meditating. That's beautiful. I love that because I have people say that to me all the time. I, I don't, I can't do it right. I don't know if I'm doing it right. It's actually in Buddhism, it's actually one of the hinder, hindrances that are specified. Um, and it's one that plagues. Um, it's one of the main ones that plagues beginners doubt. Um, and it, the, the, we just can't believe it. It's that simple. And we try and complicate it. We try to complicate everything, don't we? It just yeah. seems to be the human uh, condition. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm really interested in mindfulness. One of the things I do with my clients always is teach them how, like we do a, a little exercise very early in our relationship, eating a piece of chocolate or a strawberry or something with the five senses. So I feel that that's a way for people to kind of tune in to mindfulness. What would you suggest to someone starting? Because I think that being, like you said, paying attention to the thoughts is a way to get into the meditation or to be meditating. That's how you're meditating. But how does mindfulness fit into that whole circle? What you're describing is uh, mindfulness of eating, which is an actual practice. Um, it's a very good one. Uh, because it does engage several of the senses, but you're not going to get the depths of peace and joy. You're not going to bliss out on mindful eating in the same way that you can in meditation. In meditation, there's actual actually um, states called jhanas, which are ecstatic states. Now, literal ecstasy that all the sages talk about, that can be achieved through meditation, but it can't be achieved through eating a piece of chocolate. That makes sense, yeah. But it's a, it's a way, the, the way I kind of feel it is that it's a way to start paying attention to, to little things, to, to the, the way something feels or smells. Or it's, it's a very, very good complementary practice to a meditation. Now, the thing is, it is great, it is wonderful, I do it, I teach it, but I don't think the hook is there to get someone um, like, wow, I need this in my life. You know, maybe they'll do it three or four times and they'll be like, oh, they'll go back to watching the telly and eating that way. You, you've got to establish um, for, for a practice to start becoming life-changing we have to make it indispensable. And we're only, the only way we're going to do that is by tasting the fruits, the real fruits of it. Now, a lot of people say, and in my group, they say, um, oh, you only need to meditate 15 minutes a day, or some say 10 or five even. And I say, well, you will get some benefits like that. You know, it, it is beneficial, it's better than nothing. But as Rick Hansen, um, he's, he's written The Buddha's Brain and things like that. Um, he's a neuroscientist. He says that mindfulness is dose dependent. 
and it absolutely is. Now, if you have a thimble full of wine, you're not gonna feel a thing. But if you have a bottle, you're really gonna know what wine feels like. And, and using it frequently, like having more than five minutes a day, so a half an hour or an hour, and not just once a week. Like a lot of people who go to yoga just once a week, well, that's, that's nice, but it's not really gonna make a big difference. And as well as that, actually. Um, so you sit for 30 minutes, um, 40 minutes, whatever. The longer you sit, the deeper you start going into meditation. So you go into deeper states of consciousness. So one of my teachers have said, it takes half an hour even before you pre you're just preparing to enter these states at that time. So if you're doing five minutes, 10 minutes or 15, you're never gonna taste the absolute joy. And it is like better than everything. You're never going to taste that. So you're never gonna get hooked. So I say to people who are beginners, I say, go on a meditation retreat. This might be for a weekend. You know, I first started going on weekend ones. And this is where the whole weekend is in silence and you meditate for like eight to 10 hours a day. You're not allowed to make eye contact. All of your meals are eaten mindfully, as we were describing. And you come out of that after the weekend and you're like, whoa, it's a revelation. I found something life changing. It must be hard to come back after something like that, then be bombarded with everything that's in the, the, the world. Oh, it's crazy. So I've driven out of um, 10 day retreats before and somebody comes behind you like Pippin and because you're just cruising at like 30 or something because you're just so, you're in another world. You know, we have these one experience, but we can bring plenty back with us. I, th I guess that's, that's what I'm hoping to bring to folks with this interview is that we've, we've, we can get a little taste. And by the way, I would like to recommend people to tune into your um, mindfulness, um, the guided meditations you do. Tell us again, where, tell us where that is so they can, people can tune into it to get started. Yes, yeah, so um, <clears throat> I've got about maybe 70 episodes or so um on a podcast that's called um mindfulnessman.podbean.com or i've got a group i started that a little over two years ago um during the pandemic and that's over half a million now oh, my goodness yeah and that came that came from absolutely nowhere so i teach on that too so that's a facebook group called mindfulness in daily life so, and there's other places as well, but if you, um, you, if you come to either one of those, you can find, find the me. others. Yeah. Right. Because I, I, I would love to encourage people. There are so many benefits, physical, mental, psychological, you know, the actual brain health benefits of meditation. And that's why I was so happy that you would uh, able to come on. If they can just get started, if they can just see a little bit, do one of the guided meditations you had a loving kindness meditation that i listened to a couple of days ago and it's just so beautiful even that guided meditation puts one in a different mindset absolutely i've resolved real life um issues with that with that practice you know i've practiced with someone i'm having a difficulty with several times and it's magically melted away all hostility and they're like oh i don't know what my problem was and it is sorted i even had um i even had um, an internet troll who was giving me a big hard time many years ago about 15 years ago and every day i'd wake up and on twitter there'd be like reams of abuse that had been happening all night and one day i practiced loving kindness towards him and um, I just, the way I responded, it was in how I responded to him. And he sent me a DM, a message, and he's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize you were like this. And, and, and he became my, my publicist. He was like, you must meet this guy. He's amazing. He went from being my absolute enemy to like publicizing me. 
So it really works. Yes, I truly believe that. I, I, I have a version of the loving kindness meditation that I've got online too, just because I think it's so powerful. And it's just, yeah, we, we all, I believe we all need a way to let go and help others let go so the world isn't so traumatic. Absolutely. Um, actually, you reminded me as well um, on something I'd like to speak about. Sure. Um, because people ask in our group the whole time their problems. And one of their problems were fear of loneliness. Now, this used to be my number one fear my absolute number one. I had to be around people all of the time. If I was in on my own for one evening, I'd feel really depressed, like I was missing out on life. And I started meditating and I went from that to the other extreme. I didn't even want to be near people. And I fell in love with my own company. And I can't ever imagine like at the moment, my wife and family are away. They've gone to Switzerland and I'm loving it. I'm all on my own and it's just what I want. I understand that. I totally get that. My husband was away for two weeks and I was here on the property by myself and I was like, yeah. And I didn't really care if I saw another living soul for two weeks. I, it was so happy just being here, being with me, walking my labyrinth. And, and that's another question I wanted to ask you about devices like labyrinths, about doing um, mandalas. For people who are maybe not into this yet, do you find that those might be helpful to get started? Um, possibly, or, well, yes, obviously, because there's like, you know, they've got a whole heritage and um, I can use them. So I can't say personally, um, but yeah, try everything. You know, I, we're not living in an age now where, you know, you've got to be one thing. You can cherry pick, although there's danger in that too, but um, you can cherry pick your favorite practices. I currently practice things from Hinduism, um, Buddhism, and I'm fine with it. Sure. Well, the way I, I like, again, to me, as, as a brain health coach, not as somebody who's really deeply into meditation, although I do meditate. Um, I feel that there are so many people who are kind of afraid of it for so many reasons. And then, then you get the whole religious thing saying, oh my God, you're you know connecting with the devil or something. You get that whole fear factor going on. But to me, whatever I can offer someone to get them started is powerful. Chris, this has been wonderful, and I hope I hope that people will connect with you on Facebook, um, catch your podcast. I will be sure to put those links in the show notes. And if there was one thing you would like to say to people about meditation and how it could help them long term, brain health, whatever you feel, what would you like to say? I would say, um, I mean, this is me delving into Buddhism now. But very practically, um, not for Buddhists, for everyone, it's the nature of life. We all suffer. Now, by suffer, I don't mean we're screaming in agony. I mean that we have issues in our lives. You know, we're not comfortable with how things are. Um, unpleasant things happen and they shake us and they shake us to the core. And it doesn't have to be that way. Um, I myself have got stressful things. I'm having the most stressful period of my life right now. I've had thing after thing hit me. But through knowing this and through knowing meditation, I can see that number one, it's not permanent. It comes and it goes. And number two, it's not really who I am. You know, I can look at this and and that I can create a distance, a healthy distance from it. So I'm not tangled up in a storm. I'm not what Buddhists call suffering. I freed myself of it. The things are still occurring, but I'm not in there with them drowning. That's beautiful. It's like the worst things that happen, happen in our brains most of the time, like our thoughts, that's because they're mostly not true. And the worst thing that can happen is, is from our imagination. Yeah, and they normally don't even happen. You know, we, 
we fret and worry about something and then it turns out just fine. Exactly. Again, Chris, thank you so much. And I know you're, you are in a stressful time and I so much appreciate you taking time to share your wisdom with those of us here at Brain Health Matters. I really appreciate it. And it's lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Thank you. You've been listening to the Brain Health Matters podcast, created and hosted by Kate Kunkel. You'll find more episodes along with the latest brain health research on our website at brainhealthmatters.today. We hope you've enjoyed the show. And if there's a topic you'd like to learn more about, let us know. We'll see if we can't find someone who can talk about it. And your help getting the word out is also appreciated by writing a review, subscribing, or sharing our podcast. Thanks again for joining us. See you next week. Brain Health Matters is brought to you by The Musical Brain, book three in the Healthy Brain series. Enjoy the fun and easy practices in this book to improve your memory, sharpen focus, and master your mind with the healing power of music. Available on Amazon everywhere.